I've always been a sick child. It was never bad enough to warrant a trip to the hospital, but it was always something that was hanging over me. I was smaller and less energetic than most kids my age. While they preferred to run around and play outside, I chose to stay inside and read. The slightest bit of activity was enough to exhaust me for days on end. It wasn't a bad life, but I can certainly see how it made me into the introverted person I am today. I took comfort in books, and I experienced the world through them. It wasn't until I turned 23 that I began to question myself. Everyone around me seemed to be getting married and settling down. But I wasn't. I had a few friends at work, but no one I really hung out with in my free time. My family was gone. I lost my father at a very young age to a heart attack, brought on by a lifetime of high cholesterol. And my mother passed away shortly after I graduated college from an extremely malignant form of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. My mother clung on to life for a few weeks before her body shut down. I remember my last memory of her in the hospital. She was so thin that it looked like the slightest breeze would take her from me. Her eyes were bright and feverish, and her skin was yellowed like the pages of an old book. The palliative, Demerol, that they were giving her to ease her into her final moments robbed her of any coherent last words. She just stared at me with her glassy eyes as the end came for her. I clutched her hand in mine, but it was like she wasn't even there. I told her I loved her. She didn't respond. She just closed her eyes and let everything go. I decided that it was time for me to do the same. I had no close family nearby or any real friends. I was alone in the world. I put in my two weeks notice at the small company that was gracious enough to hire me fresh-eyed out of college and left town shortly after my mother's funeral. In all honesty, I didn't want to stay there any longer. Everything reminded me of what was gone and what I was missing out on. After selling our house and settling the matter of her will, I had enough left to get far away. I chose the countryside. I wanted to be alone with my thoughts for a while. I felt like I needed some time to work through everything and decide on my next course of action. My inheritance afforded me that privilege. In hindsight, I realized that this was the worst possible choice in my life. Living alone, with only my thoughts to keep me company, a mile away from my closest neighbor, only served to deepen my sense of isolation. I was alone with my thoughts, and I quickly realized that none of them were good. I think my mental state only quickened my descent into sickness. It began when I noticed a small mass on my left upper arm, just underneath the skin. It was about the size of a pea, and I could move it around under my skin, about a quarter of an inch or so in each direction. At first I told myself it was a fatty deposit and nothing to be concerned about. Under palpitation, I experienced a slight discomfort, but no more than that when manipulating any other section of my body. It wasn't until I noticed that it was slowly growing that I began to get concerned. I eventually broke down and went to see a doctor, who assured me that it was likely a lipoma or xanthoma, and was nothing to be concerned about. He reassured me that it was more likely a symptom of high cholesterol rather than a sign of cancer. He explained that, while family history and genetics had given me a bad hand, that didn't necessarily mean I couldn't live a long, healthy life. I was still unsure about the lump, which led me to asking if we could biopsy it. He reasoned that there was no real need to do so, that they were harmless. 
Since the mass was movable under my skin, it meant that it was encapsulated and was likely benign. He said that getting a sample would only confirm what we already knew, and would cost me about $400. He advised me to cut back on my red meats and come back if I noticed any change in the lipoma. I thanked him and left the hospital feeling comforted. That reassurance lasted about a month. For the first days, I was constantly poking and prodding the small lump. After about a week, when I was confident that the mass hadn't grown any, I went back to my usual life of solitude. I woke up late every morning and read. I did some minor chores around the house and thought about what direction I wanted my life to go in and what field I wanted to work in. Sometimes I would go days without talking to anyone. Looking back, I now realize how unhealthy it was to isolate myself after my mother's unexpected death. I was stagnating, and I didn't even realize it. About a month after getting my lipoma checked out, I began to experience a stinging pain in my upper left arm. That discomfort brought back the memory of my visit to the doctor. The mass on my arm was now dime-sized. I could still move it, but now the slightest touch felt like I was being poked with a needle. I left it alone for a few days, hoping against hope that it was all in my imagination. But the pain continued. I think some sad part of me thought that it would go away if I just ignored it long enough. To be honest, I was afraid of going back to the hospital. That was partly due to the fact that I was afraid of what the diagnosis would be. A growth can be a symptom of cancer. My mother's experience in the hospital also kept me from going. I lived with the slowly growing mass for about a week before I realized how dire the situation was. It wasn't until I woke up one night with a stinging pain in my arm that I decided to go back to the doctor. I rolled out of bed and went to the bathroom to look at my arm. I figured that I'd slept on it wrong, or possibly struck it against something, and that was what was causing me pain. I realized how wrong I was when I flipped on the light switch and saw a small bit of caked blood around the area on my upper arm. I hopped into the shower to wash away the silver dollar-sized splotch of blood and had a startling realization. There was a fingernail sticking out of my arm. At first I thought that I'd inadvertently rolled over and accidentally jabbed a clipped toenail into my skin. But as I went to pull it, I experienced a sudden tearing pain that actually made me gasp. It felt like I'd grabbed a nerve ending and pulled on it. I rinsed off the area and examined it. The nail appeared to be sticking out of my skin rather than piercing it. When I painfully shifted the lipona, the nail wiggled and receded further into my skin as if it was part of the mass itself. I made up my mind there and then to go to the doctor first thing in the morning. At first, the doctor tried to rationalize it the same way that I did. He said that it was likely a lipoma, and my constant worrying was just making it more pronounced. It wasn't until after I showed him the area that he began to take me seriously. He concluded that the skin ruptured outward instead of inwards, which meant that it had come from under my skin and poked out. I asked if he would excise the lump so we could examine it, and he agreed, due to possible risks of infection, and to identify the cause for the growth. I turned down his offer of a general anesthetic. He tried to convince me that it would be easier with one, but I asked for a local anesthetic instead. I remembered my mother's final moments. Even if it was going to be a simple procedure, I didn't want to experience anything like that ever in my life. A part of me realized that it was my fear of being in the same situation as her 
that made me so stubborn about the anaesthetics. After he explained the procedure to me and its risks, I followed him into the operating room, laid down on the table, and waited for him to begin. I did my best to look away while he worked. I imagined turning my head to see what was happening, only to sneeze into the open wound, or faint from the mere sight of the surgery. I did gather up enough courage to look towards the end, though. I looked up into the mirror to see about an inch of skin peeled away, with a slightly red mass beneath it. It didn't look nearly as grotesque or as sickening as I'd thought. Instead, it looked clinical and clean. He set an object in the tray and proclaimed, think I got it. Now, let's just see what we have. I heard him drop the heavy tweezers on the ground as if something had shocked him. I went to look, but he told me I needed to stay still until he could suture up the area. He reassured me that the utensil had just slipped out of his hands and it was nothing to be worried about. I waited for 10 agonizing minutes of uncertainty as he sutured the area and swabbed it down again with betadine. When he finished, I sat up and looked at what he'd set down in the tray. It was a greyish mass that was about the size of a misshapen marble. Through the antiseptic scent of the hospital, I smelled something like spoiled meat. I felt my stomach turn as the realization that this had been inside me and had just begun to rot. One end terminated in what looked like a fingernail that had broken through my skin. It wasn't until he asked me if I knew what the term fetus in fetu meant that I connected all the macabre pieces of the jigsaw. Fetus in fetu, a parasitic twin. We went into the examination room where the doctor explained what he thought was happening as he gave me a complete look over. He posited that I'd started off with a twin, but somewhere along the way, I'd absorbed my twin into my body. It had likely siphoned off nutrients, which explained my lethargic activity and smaller stature when I was younger. He assumed that the mass had been reabsorbed by my body over the years, and there was likely nothing left except that small piece we had just removed. As he palpitated my back, and his face turned cold. I knew that that was not what had happened. The doctor said he felt something just above my right kidney and that exploratory surgery was necessary. He told me that the sooner they performed the surgery, the better. I agreed and he asserted that I would need to be completely anesthetized for the operation. It was then that I was forced to accept my worst fear. I would have to be sedated like my mother was. I tried to talk my way out of the situation, but my doctor explained that this was a life-threatening issue that needed to be resolved. I eventually relented and consented to the surgery. 